good day to you. Glad to have you back here at Bethlehem of Lutheran of Calusa. And uh, if you are new, I hope that you enjoy the message that we have for this, this day. In the Psalm 116, the end right here, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? And then listen to these words, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. See, the Lord is our salvation. In the Old Testament, no matter how far you have drifted, God is ready to pardon. He is not like us. And then in Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians, good can come from bad situations. Trust in God and just look what he has done for Paul, the persecutor. Races from prison. Matthew 20, 1 through 16, a whole new way of this dispensing justice, God's way of grace. Join together with me as we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. What, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. In the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and will be forever. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and call on the name of the Lord. The Lord be with you also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, since we cannot stand before you relying on anything we have done, help us trust in your abiding grace and live according to your word through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading from Isaiah, the 55th chapter. Seek the Lord, well he may be found. Call upon him, well he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul's letter to the Philippians, the first chapter. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He's speaks us from being in prison in Rome. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. For I know that 
through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. <clears throat> for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard, hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand now in honor of Christ, if you are able. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. Glory, Glory be to thee, O Lord. Lord. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and going out about the third hour, he saw another standing idle in the marketplace, and to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same, and about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, Why do you stand there idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired, about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when the hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the denarius, and on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, and have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Do you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I chose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Let us join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Jesus will direct it for his aid and counsel us. Jesus will perfect it. Every morn with Jesus rise, and when day is ended, in his name then close your eyes. Be to him and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus the Christ. We start off today with a problem. People even in the church often don't understand grace. The disciples certainly had to learn all about grace from Jesus. The disciples knew how the Old Testament church worked. They were brought up in it. They knew it. They understood it. But Jesus is saying things will be changed. In this section on Matthew, including last Sunday, we hear about undeserved goodness towards the sinner. Paul, perhaps more than any other apostle, knew all about this undeserved forgiveness, as he was a persecutor and a killer of the followers of Jesus. The Jews were great persecutors, those who stood far off and away from the temple, not feeling welcomed. It was follow our rule or don't come in, no grace. Here. Second problem is that without understanding, we revert to laws. Rules. Don't eat this or that. What day is important, as we heard last Sunday, but where is grace then? Jesus tells us that it should be forgiveness to the max of those who repent. And yet, even that 70 times 7 or 490 is more than a number. It's all about completeness. It's all about continuous forgiveness. Problem number three, we can't see what is obvious. The solution was at hand, but not understood. Forgiveness is open-ended. 
Jesus came to save the lost, not to condemn the lost and the disenfranchised. Matthew 20 continues this theme of grace. Let us dig in today's parable of labors in the vineyard and what insight can we get here? What can we see? Who are the first and why? Who are the last and why? And then why does it reverse? How does it relate to eternal life and the last judgment? How does it relate to the church? A whole new way of dispersing justice and God's way of grace. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Now the first point of interest here is that when you dig into this, into the Greek language, you see that this was a, an exchange of words, an agreement was made. A dialogue between the master and those laborers, how much would they work for? Jesus continues with his parable of the kingdom. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Now notice here that there's no dialogue. No, okay, how much? Going out again the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And okay, how much? You don't hear a thing about it. They just go. But wait. Things get even more interesting because about the 11th hour, the last hour of the work day, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. He said, you go into the vineyard too. Now, my friends, being a day laborer is tough. No regular job. You might ask the question is, why did these last ones hold back early in the morning? Why weren't they there? Did they expect rejection? Now, we also have to look and understand this whole thing in here, this whole parable is about the church. It's about God's kingdom on earth. How do we relate to that? We'll look into that a bit. Now, and when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. Now, the first question you want to ask God, well, who are the first and, and why? <clears throat> well, the first were, are like the Israelites. Those first chosen by God to bring grace to the nations, through the sacrifices, through the temple system. Question two, who are the last and why? And the last would be the Gentiles. Those that Jesus wants to reach out to, that's his ministry, that's his mission. And even the priests that would join up with Christ after his resurrection and after the coming of the Holy Spirit. So do you get the picture? Now back to the parable of the kingdom of heaven. Notice that the kingdom, it is not the kingdom in heaven, it's not that kingdom of glory, but it is the kingdom of heaven, what happens on earth that, his, that has eternal consequences, and this is the church on earth, his church. Now back to those who consider that they are number one and those who think they are the least in the kingdom. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius a day's wage for labor or for a Roman soldier. So the third question is, why, why is this reversal going to happen now? Why did he go backwards in the first place in paying them? And the reason is that if he paid the denarius first to those who were first, well, they'd never even hear about who got what else. They'd take off and go home. Jesus has a very clever parable here. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, and you have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Now, this kind of sounds, <clears throat> at the onset, kind of a good question to ask. But Jesus was changing everything. The Israelites who were called first to administer God's grace 
left out the Gentiles, left out the poor, left out the disease, thinking that they were cursed by God. These firsts had maintained the temple and the commandments of God and thought they deserved more, a better Messiah, and they had added hundreds and hundreds of laws that were so difficult for the, even the children of Israel to follow, let alone a foreigner. In the text, Jesus replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? He says, Take what belongs to you and go. What did Jesus mean by this? Remember, this is tying in with God's church on earth. This is tying in with the dispensing of grace and forgiveness. Basically, Jesus is saying through these words of this parable, take your temple, your man-made laws, and go. All those things with which you have burdened your people, and take with you too your trumpet set, sound out your prayers on the corners, and, and your, your pride, take it all, as Jesus says in another place. The praise they get there is all they're going to get. Only something earthly. Those things you trust in are yours. You go. You have missed the main message from God, forgiveness through the blood of Christ. My ways are not your ways. He goes on to say, I choose to give to this last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity so the last will be first and the first last? Question number four. How does it relate to eternal life in the last judgment? You need to take a little look in the Bible and see that on the last judgment day, the coming of the Son of Man in Matthew 24, it talks about judgment. It talks about the things that are going to happen that for, forego the things that are about to happen. Perhaps some pe think, people think that in this world right now, we've got these kind of things happening. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, a tribulation that will be like never before, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory in verse 31, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. The elect, the elect we see are the first. The elect are those who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. The elect are those who have set aside all kinds of earthly laws and all kinds of prejudices. And they said Jesus is the only way. We in the church, God's kingdom on earth, must not think because we believe first that we are better than the poor and the disadvantaged who do not yet know Christ. We need to serve them and not have them be afraid to come forward, to know that God's way is a grace a grace way and not a works way. And no matter how hard you try, you cannot make up for what God has done for you. And finally, the last question is, how does this give us comfort even on a deathbed? You see, because God's way is grace, grace, undeserved grace, this must be what we share with those who are coming into the church at any time, whether they are infants or, or teenagers or middle-aged or older folks or even people on their deathbed, as I have experienced, that we do receive Christ and are baptized into his kingdom and pass into eternity with a smile on their face. God's grace, grace undeserved grace. God's way is always fair. All who believe on him and who are baptized shall be saved. Grace, grace, and eternal life. 
That's what God's kingdom is about on this earth. And the people of God say, Amen. Now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all those people out there that are hurting right now. We are praying for those who are near death and perhaps are hearing this message or having it told to them by a friend, a relative, that they still have hope. But by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, by his death, by the forgiveness of, of the price paid by his blood on the cross, that they, no matter how they have been in the past, can change right now and become a believer in Jesus and fear not the future. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor because you are the elect, the first, the chosen. Be now in peace. Amen. they were thinking. How are we going to get across the water? And then God does a miracle there too and makes it dry ground so they can walk across. And so when we are on the verge of the Jordan, 
What does that mean? It means that we are on this side of heaven. We are about to cross over into our promised land and that we have no fear. We need have no fear of what is on the other side of death. God be with you in this coming week. May it be a blessing to you in your life and, and in the lives of others that you are in touch with. God be with you.